Now on Long Crime Report, a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer leads to the arrest of more than a dozen men belonging to militia groups. Plus, an appeal in the Bill Cosby case has been set for December 1st. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court will hear Cosby's appeal on his felony sexual assault charges. And later, Los Angeles police released body cam footage of a disturbing attack at a police station. This is the Long Crime Report, diving into true crime and all legal stories making headlines. Welcome everyone, I'm Terry Austin and you're watching the Long Crime Report. 13 men arrested in a thwarted plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Six of them face federal charges and seven of them face state charges. Let's take a look at the governor's statement right after the arrest. Good afternoon. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who were preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. When I put my hand on the Bible and took the oath of office 22 months ago, I knew this job would be hard. But I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. I want to start by saying thank you to our law enforcement. Thank you to the fearless FBI agents. And thank you to the brave Michigan State Police Troopers who participated in this operation, acting under the leadership of Colonel Joe Gasper. I also want to thank Attorney General Nessel and the U.S. Attorneys Burge and Schneider and their teams for pursuing criminal charges that hopefully will lead to convictions, bringing these sick and depraved men to justice. As a mom with two teenage daughters and three stepsons, my husband and I are eternally grateful to everyone who put themselves in harm's way to keep our family safe. That was Governor Whitmer. Now, we are so lucky to have with us today a special guest, a Michigan trial attorney, Jamie White. Jamie, welcome to the show. Hey, Terry. Thanks for having me. This is such a shocking development. I am sure that the Michigan legal you know, community is just as shocked as the rest of the nation. What are they talking about? People are appalled. Um, they're frightened. Uh, they're frustrated by um, what's led up to this event, and you know, quite frankly, frustrated by the responses from um, some elected officials to date. Um, you know, people are certainly um, surrounding the governor, and you know, to support her under these circumstances. I'm pleased to report that leadership in our state legislature, which is Republican have been really extraordinary over the last 24 hours as far as condemning these acts and um, offering their support to the governor. Um, so, you know, we are bracing for further activity. This particular plot is shocking and maybe not predictable, but I don't know that it wasn't predictable that there was going to be some form of violence or, um, you know, a credible threat of violence as we um, ramp up towards this election. Um, you know, we know that um, there was a gun rally at the state capital of Michigan where um, several of these individuals participated in that rally who were now indicted by the federal government. Um, we know that um, the president himself um, made certain statements suggesting that Michigan be liberated. Um, and that uh, these were good people and that the governor should give a little and attempt to work with them. So there's been, you know, a, a, a march towards um, legitimizing these individuals for some period of time. And, uh, you know, based on the events of, of, of late, uh, it's no shock that these men have gotten to the point of violence, but it is very, very troubling that they targeted our governor. I agree. You know, you mentioned the fact that everyone is working together, whether they're on the left, whether they're on the right. And I was truly impressed with the way all of the authorities work together to investigate this domestic terrorist plot. I mean, it seems as though FBI, local authorities, everybody was working together. They had an informant. Do you think that that was what led to this being solved before the plot was actually carried out? Sure. 
Um, you know, as far as law enforcement working together, I, I agree with you. It's really a breath of fresh air to see law enforcement cast in the slate. We certainly have had problems over the course of the, the spring and summer, but this is um, a breath of fresh air. Um, in fact, um, I'm proud to announce that my brother, he's a 25-year veteran of the Michigan State Police, and he was one of the arresting officers um, in the city of Munich yesterday that um, apprehended the two individuals um, who are who now stand indicted. So um, I have watched this personally, and um, it's, it's been a breath of fresh air. To your question, though, as far as the confidential informants and what led to this, there is no question that the confidential informant played a absolute Without this confidential informant, you know, we don't know what would have happened. Uh, the thing about domestic terrorism that makes it challenging from a law enforcement point of view is that um, while people may be under suspicion, you know, they enjoy the safeguards of the U.S. Constitution. So unlike foreign um, international terrorists who are not protected by our U.S. Constitution, um, Law enforcement has a lot more latitude. The FBI, CIA, and so on and so on have a lot more latitude to spy on these individuals, um, where in the United States, um, it's much more difficult. And But for the confidential informant, um, we could be having a different conversation today. Well, thank your brother for his service as a police yeah. officer, and I'm grateful that he is safe and sound. We know also that there was a plot to actually not only kidnap the governor, but to attack the police and use a bomb if necessary. Is that what you heard as well? That's correct. Um, you know, a careful reading of the indictment suggests that the two groups really had separate plots, but we're working together, in particular, for the purposes of logistical support. And I think when you look at the um, charges that have been made against the, um, the seven men who were charged in the state of Michigan, the primary charges are logistical support of terrorism, whether that was money, equipment, and so on. And there's some associated gun charges, and some of them are charged with being related to gangs. But if you read it carefully, um, both groups at some point in time had intentions on hurting police or killing police. Um, the conspirators to kidnap um, discussed, um, you know, attacking police stations, blowing up bridges, doing things to interfere, um, you know, with the law enforcement response to the actual kidnapping, while the other group actually um, were targeted because it became known to law enforcement that they were seeking the addresses of certain law enforcement officers here in the state of Michigan. Um, so these men were acting in concert, but they also had their own individual schemes. And, um, you know, we can only hope that, uh, you know, that's the end of it. Because, you know, what we know from these kinds of cases, Terry, is that you have 13 individuals who are charged. And, you know, we call it the, uh, the iceberg concept. And, you know, it's, it's pretty common sense. You know, you have a tip of the iceberg and then what's underneath it. And, you know, I think in a case like this, it's, there's probably another 10 or 20 individuals who are associated with each one of these 13. Um, in fact, but for um, the immediacy of needing to thwart this plan, I suspect that law enforcement probably would have followed these individuals for as long as they could. But obviously, um, the, the governor's life and her family is, is more important than anything. So they stepped in. Uh, I'll be shocked if these 13 men don't start telling on each other, telling on other people, and, and we will probably see a superseding federal indictment and probably a modified state um, information outlining new charges and new defendants at some point in time in the future. Exactly. Let's hope that they start talking and that we can find out about other people who might be having these types of plans. And we know it was planned out. Apparently, they were staking out the governor's vacation home. They were doing surveillance. They actually detonated a bomb to practice. This all sounds quite premeditated to me. Do you agree? No, there's, there's no question. Um, the only legal question at this point in time is, did their actions rise to the level of um, an actual criminal conspiracy, or was it a bunch of, you know, rejects sitting around in a basement just talking fantasy? And I think that um, based on the evidence that you've outlined and other evidence um, that, you know, we believe is going to be forthcoming, you know, it's important to keep in mind that the affidavit is only offered for the purpose of probable cause. You know, the U.S. attorney has not shown all their cards. I probably, I suspect they haven't even shown a quarter of the deck. Um, so at the end of the day, the question will be, was there an overt act, um, a substantial effort to carry out 
this crime. And again, for all the reasons you've already stated and several more that are out there, um, I don't think there's any question these men were not playing, they were not playing around. Exactly. You know, one of the things that really impressed me was the governor's response. She was so strong. She said that, you know, she's still going to do her job. Did you get that impression? Has she always been that strong? She has. You know, she's a, you know, I, uh, she, not only is she my governor, she's a personal friend of mine. And, um, you know, she has just been so impressive um, in all the years that I've known her. So there was nothing surprising about the fortitude she displayed to the country and the world yesterday, um, despite, you know, having to live through this terror for, you know, some period of time. I think we can presume that she's known about this for a period of time, um, but unnerving nonetheless. So not shocking at all. She is a, a, an extremely strong woman and leader. Um, I thought that um, her response to this incident and her interactions, you know, with the president have been appropriate above board. Um, she's attempted to unite and not divide. And that's the Governor Whitmer and Gretchen Whitmer that I've known. Well, it has been amazing having you on, Jamie. I am so yeah. grateful you were able to come today and shed some light on this story. And take a break right now. And when we come back, we'll be talking about many other cases, including Breonna Taylor. Maxwell was among Epstein's closest associates and helped him exploit girls who were as young as 14 years old. Maxwell played a critical role in helping Epstein to identify, befriend, and groom minor victims for abuse. In some cases, Maxwell participated in the abuse herself. As alleged, Maxwell and Epstein had a method. Typically, they would befriend these young girls by asking them questions about their lives, pretending to be taking an interest in them. They would take them to the movies and treat them to shopping trips. Maxwell would encourage these young girls to accept offers from Epstein to pay for their travel and their education, making these young victims feel indebted to Jeffrey Epstein. After developing a rapport with the victims, Maxwell then tried to normalize sexual abuse with a minor victim through a process known as grooming. For example, Maxwell would discuss sexual topics with the victim and undress in front of the victim or be present for sex acts involving the minor victims and Epstein. Maxwell's presence as an adult woman helped put the victims at ease. As Maxwell and Epstein intended, this grooming process left the minor victims susceptible to sexual abuse. Welcome back. That was Audrey Sprouse. She was describing Ghislaine Maxwell's connection to the Jeffrey Epstein case. Federal prosecutors asked the judge if they could hold off on producing school photos of the victims because of the ongoing investigation. You may recall, obviously, that Maxwell was arrested in July for allegedly enticing minors to engage in illegal sex acts with Jeffrey Epstein. We have with us today to break down this case Joseph Scott Morgan. He's our forensic expert investigator and Gabriela Teresa Gonzalez, our criminal defense attorney. Welcome both of you to the show. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. Gigi, thank you, thank you. Gigi, I'm going to start with you. You know, the court filings say that these documents are school photos, and the prosecution wants to hold that back. But generally speaking, when we have a criminal case like this, doesn't the prosecution usually share whatever evidence they might have with the defense? Absolutely. It's a vital part of our, you know, constitutional right. You know, we're allowed to have this information. We're allowed to know who's accusing us so that we can confront those accusers in trial. You know, so it's important for the prosecutors to deliver this evidence. However, this is not an unusual situation, uh, especially when you have special victims such as minors, you know, involved in this case. 
Um, so the judge is going to have to balance out the constitutional right of the defendant to be able to prepare adequately for trial and also the victim's right to not have their information, uh, you know, dispersed to, throughout the public. And this is a very high profile case where any information that comes out about this case is going to be received on an international level. So it's a very important balance. But I do think that, you know, the prosecutors in this case uh, um, asking the judge to consider allowing them releasing this information to the defense within eight weeks of the trial, um, I don't think is reasonable. Uh, the defense deserves an ample amount of time or a reasonable amount of time to prepare a defense for what's going to be a very long winded trial. Exactly. Every defendant deserves to have a trial and have a trial that is fair. Joseph, one of the things that really confused me a little bit is the prosecution has these school photos, and apparently they will be introducing them at some point. I'm wondering why are they using these photos? Do you think they want to show that at the time these girls were very, very young, so they're using their school photos? I mean, couldn't they use some other photos of the women that we are, you know, talking about here? I think that's a key question, Terry, and we have to contextualize it, and I think that that's what they're attempting to do. I, one of my thoughts is this, when they use this term school photo, what do they mean? Is this like the typical yearbook headshot that we're talking about, or is this involved, does this have them involved in uh, group activities at school, you know, like on the JV basketball team or chess club or, you know, what math club or whatever the case might be. I think that that's important. And also keep in mind from an investigative standpoint, in many of these cases, there are not that many degrees of separation from a lot of these young ladies, these children at the time that were involved in the scheme because he would use these individuals and she would use these individuals to actively go out and recruit other youngsters that were in their sphere. It was like, you know, they've described it as like a hunting ground uh, for a predator, and it really is. And I'm uh, one other thing, I, I'll be very brief, I, that I was, I kind of keyed in on what you said there, Terry, about the international spotlight, as I have always held for. Uh, when we think about the island, we think about all these things, this, this goes beyond the United States. OK, we, we've heard we've heard whispers about things out of Eastern Europe, young children coming out of there. I, I'm, th you know, my hashtag has always been where are the children, where are the children and all of this. So you have probably got an ongoing investigation that's being headed up by people like Interpol. Uh, what are the origins? What was the destination? What was the outcome for these young women uh, all over the world? Because I think it's that impactful. I agree. I think it is that impactful. This is going to be one of those cases that all of us are going to be watching very carefully. Let's switch gears now. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court will hear Bill Cosby's appeal of his felony sex assault conviction, which was on December 1st. Cosby, or that will be on December 1st, Cosby is serving a three to 10 year prison term. So, Gigi, let me ask you this question. We have a lower appeals court. They upheld Cosby's conviction. But the state's higher court will now review two key issues. One issue is whether or not the jury should have heard evidence that Cosby had given quaaludes to women in the past. That evidence came from Cosby's own deposition testimony in a related lawsuit, you might recall. Should this evidence have been permitted to show a pattern? Yes, absolutely. There are key, two key issues here on appeal. One is whether or not the jurors should have heard uh, Bill Cosby's own words in a deposition where he admitted to slipping quaaludes to his victims. That is very relevant evidence. Um, it's going to uh, pass the, the smell test as far as admissibility is concerned. So I don't see the appeal uh, courts reversing on that issue. And the next issue is whether or not uh, the state was proper in allowing Molino uh, witnesses in. And as we know, the Molino rule is you cannot prove against a defendant any crimes that are not listed in the indictment with exceptions. And the exceptions being that the witnesses 
uh, you know, speaking on the case have experience with past uh, dealings in the same light, right? So the Molino witness in this instance are they're going to be discussing, you know, their interactions with Bill Cosby when they when he slipped them drugs that rendered them unconscious without their consent. Yes, it's a charge that is it's a crime that is not charged in the indictment, but it goes to past behavior by Bill Cosby that proves his propensity to slip women drugs and take advantage of them while they're unconscious. Right. You raise a very good point about the quaaludes, and it leads me right to my question to Joseph. What kind of effect would a quaalude have on an individual in this type of circumstances? Would she be able to make her own decisions? Would she be able to move? What effect does it have on your body? Oh, it's it's horrible. It it puts it puts uh, the victim uh, in a state almost of catatonia. You, they claim that with this drug, there is kind of a uh, a semi awareness that things are happening, but can you can you just imagine, just fathom for a moment? You have no control uh, over over your limbs. You have no control many times over your speech. You can't protest uh, this sort of thing. And of course, it, under the worst circumstances, uh, it can't kill people. I don't I don't know that that has happened in this particular case. But to a, a larger point, uh, you know, kind of dovetailing with what Gigi was talking about, and you as well, Terry. This goes to serialized behavior, and that's certainly something that we study in forensics. Um, let's don't forget, uh, Cosby is a, a serial perpetrator. This is something that has kind of, at least through the timelines, has been proven over and over and over again. The problem is this. There's not a lot of physical evidence tie back in this case, but this behavior where he is utilizing the quaaludes is, is very, very significant evidence. Yeah, you know, you have a good point there. There isn't a lot of physical evidence. And actually, I was going to ask you, so I'll follow up. How yeah. might that hurt the trial? There's just the women testifying, and it's his word against their word. And then there, I guess, is the digital evidence. But it will be more difficult because there is not that much physical evidence. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, there's not. I mean, it's, you know, when when investigators handle sexual assault cases, obviously, under ideal circumstances, if you can have, from an, let me rephrase that, under uh, ideal investigative circumstances, hopefully you're going to have a rape kit, and that's going to cover everything from the standard swabs to nail scrapings to all those sorts of things. Terry, we're absent that in this case. We we don't have those kind of physical tiebacks like that. Now people can talk about bruising and injuries and all that stuff, but that kind of stuff passes, and particularly when we begin to look at uh, the large amount of time. Uh, that has gone away. We look back to, uh, you know, Golden State Killer, uh, and they still had evidence in those cases because they had a dead body uh, from uh, evidence that was gathered at the scene that was able to be able to be used uh, in DNA and stuff that was collected years and years ago. You don't have that with this case. It's just not. Everybody just kind of uh, horribly went on with their lives, and these women have had to bear this burden all of these years. I just hope they don't get robbed. Right. I agree with you. I hope that this case really is ending with, you know, the the right and the justified, uh, you know, verdict here. OK, so let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be talking about the Breonna Taylor case. Welcome back, everyone. We're discussing the Breonna Taylor grand jury decision. Let's throw to when Daniel Cameron, the attorney general, handed down the charges of wanton endangerment as far as Brett Hankinson was concerned. Uh, our, the, our team walked them through every uh, homicide offense uh, and also presented all of the information uh, that was available uh, to the grand jury, and then the grand jury was ultimately the one that made the decision about uh, indicting uh, Detective Hankinson uh, for wanton endangerment. I um, think that in terms of what happened the wee hours of March 13th, uh, in terms of that particular or specific date um, and what happened that night in the apartment, uh, I think it's, uh, it is uh, unlikely that there will be any additional uh, prosecutions that come from that event itself.
That was Daniel Cameron, and he is the attorney general, and he is saying that there will be no further charges as far as the other police officers are concerned, and that there will be charges as far as Hankinson is concerned. Gigi, some people are very skeptical that the grand jury actually looked at all of the potential charges. Attorney General Cameron actually evaded questions a bit, as far as I'm concerned. Generally, the grand jury will follow the lead of what the prosecutors present in front of them. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And that's the power of the prosecutor. The prosecutor here, Daniel Cameron, had the opportunity to, uh, to give the grand jury all of the relevant facts and information for the grand jury to make a decision. And not only is the entire country wondering uh, if Daniel Cameron acted appropriately, but the actual grand jurors are asking that, and they feel that he misrepresented the entire case. Uh, it's been incredibly problematic. And at one point, he was interested in releasing the grand jury files, and then as soon as the grand jurors accused him of mishandling and misrepresenting the facts, now he wants to keep it secret, and he has more time to call out my girl Megan the Stallion for her uh, calling out um, you know, and demanding justice for the death of Breonna Taylor, but he does not have that same energy in uh, in holding accountable the persons responsible for the death of Breonna Taylor. I think that Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General Daniel Cameron, is in pretty hot water here. Gigi, you make some excellent, excellent points. He needs to be focusing on the case at hand. And the case at hand is the fact that we have Breonna Taylor, who is no longer here, and there are no charges in connection with her death. Joseph, one of the things that really concerned me is there were so many bullets that were shot from the police officers. All of the police officers, in fact, Cosgrove, Mattingly, and Hankinson, just shot wildly, as far as I was concerned. How is it that we still don't have any charges in connection with the death of Breonna Taylor herself and just have charges right now as it relates to the neighbors, none of whom who actually were shot? You know, in the South, we've got an old saying that says, let the hide come with the hair. And no matter how this thing turns out, you just need to be as transparent as you possibly can. And so for me personally, uh, you know, I know that uh, there have been, uh, uh, you know, firearms reconstructions that have been done at the scene. Uh, and uh, great detail goes into these things. I, I think that what would be advantageous here, probably, and I know that this is still pending and ongoing and all that sort of thing, but what would really be advantageous is if we could actually see um, what what structure the FBI came up with relative to the shooting recon reconstruction. And this could be explained to us as dispassionately as possible and see where all of these rounds went and what exactly they were firing at. And I would really like to see that because I think that it it could diffuse a lot of the tension. Uh, it would at least give us something to go on uh, from a scientific basis. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Let me follow up with that. There was one point where the police actually said that maybe Kenneth Walker shot Brianna. Do you remember that? I mean, if they had done what you just described, we would know for a fact whether or not something like that could have occurred. Is that correct? Uh, well, potentially, you know, it's not necessarily going to give you an indication of who fired first, but it what what shooting reconstructions do is they orient you and contextualize you to the scene. It, it gives you an idea of the position of the individuals that were firing, uh, because you know there are going to be specific ballistic tiebacks to each one of the weapons that was utilized in the scene. Now, if this gentleman, as you had mentioned, did in fact fire. Uh, hopefully they recovered spent, spent ammunition from his, as well as from the police. And that way you can kind of put those individuals in those positions, and you can also move them around by virtue of where the attitude of, of, the, uh, of the fire came from as they're moving around. Were they just in a static position, or were they moving from left to right? Did they advance? Did they retreat? All of this stuff is unanswered, so it's, it's multi-layered from a scientific standpoint. So that information is very important for us to have. Exactly. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Listen, let's switch gears to yet another tragic shooting death of Jonathan Price. An affidavit shows that Price asked the police 
how he was doing, and he actually extended his hand for a handshake. And yet, police officer Sean Lucas felt threatened and ended up shooting and killing 31-year-old Price. Now, Gigi, this is yet another tragic case. We talked about this earlier, the fact that there are so many people who are getting shot. This was an unarmed black man. Tell me what you're thinking about what is going on as far as all of these shootings are concerned. Well, first, you know, it begs the question, like, are these protests really in vain when we have uh, every week an incident where a black unarmed man is shot dead by the police? You know, and in this case, it is it is so apparent that the officer's implicit bias against African Americans played a role in this. Here you have a 22-year-old police officer fresh out of training. He was just trained, you know, and he encounters a, a black person, a person who is described as a hometown hero, a person who is described as positive and optimistic, and it's evidenced by the fact that Jonathan Price was diffusing an escalating situation, a much better job at it than the police officer. He went to go extend his hand, hand in good faith to the police officer, and the police officer felt threatened by that? Thought that Jonathan Price was drunk based on that interaction? And not only that, when the taser failed to, uh, to put down Jonathan Price the way he envisioned it, the officer unleashed four bullets into his back as he was trying to get away. It's completely unreasonable. There's absolutely no defense to the police officer's actions here. And this is exactly why this country is so upset. Police officers have to stop using lethal force when lethal force is unreasonable upset, GG, and frightened. There's no question about it with the way that unarmed Black individuals, particularly, are getting shot and killed by the police when they are not posing a threat. Joseph, you know, the medical report came back, and clearly, you know, we, we know that he was killed by gunshot wounds. But we don't have a full report. That's expected, I guess, in about uh, six to eight weeks. What do we think that full report is going to show? Will it show, you know, all the things that we need to find out about whether or not this was a murder, suicide, or whatever the case may be? Obviously not a suicide, but, you know, you've taught me that there are five, I guess, causes of death here. Manor. So uh, what, what manners of death? So what might this be? Uh, yeah, and let me tell you, let's start with the autopsy report, uh, because that's going to be crucial here. Uh, the observations of the pathologist at the medical examiner system, our center where the autopsy and the examination took place, is, is going to be key. And the reason it's key is it's going to give you uh, uh, some, again, here's that word, context as to what went down. We'll talk about things like range of fire. Uh, was there uh, was he shot at a distance per the forensic pathologist uh, uh, examination, or was is this a close up? You know, like where we look for gunpowder residue and that sort of thing um, on on the uh, adjacent to the injuries. In addition to that, one of the other things I can almost guarantee you, I've been involved in a number of these cases over my career. They're waiting on toxicology, and we hear that over and over and over again. They're going to wait for toxicology. They're not going to make a move. They're not going to release anything until that toxicology panel is fully released. Right, yeah. And, you know, what worries me about that, Gigi, is if there's any drugs at all whatsoever in that toxicology report, then we may have an instance of victim shaming, as we've seen in the past. Do you agree that that's one of the things that could ultimately result from that report? Yeah, absolutely. We see it time and time again, where victims are blamed for, uh, you know, their death because of things that they ingested hours before. But you know what I think will be more telling than the toxicology report is the body cam video. Show us the body cam video. I want to see if Jonathan Price actually did attack the police officer, if Jonathan Price really was the aggressor in this. And that video will show us that. And it'll tell us much more than any toxicology report will. Show it to me. Yeah, show it to me is right. Let's hope we can see that. So let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be looking at footage released by the uh, LAPD showing a suspect who uh, was, you know, whipping a police officer with a gun. Let's take a break and we'll be right back.
You got my gun. What? You got my gun. Welcome back, everyone. That was shocking footage released by the LAPD showing a suspect entering the harbor station and beating a police officer, stealing his gun and using it to pistol whip him before actually escaping. The attack was apparently unprovoked. You heard and saw that video in the beginning. There was no sound. Then you heard the sound afterwards when the voice kicked in. Gigi. This individual has been charged with attempted murder of a police officer, assaulting a peace officer with a deadly weapon, robbery, fleeing the scene, and resisting arrest. Most of that attack was actually on the camera, at least from the angle of the police officer. Should this be an open and shut case? It seems pretty straightforward to me. Oh, it's looking open and shut. You know, uh, there's no apparent defense, uh, at least to me, maybe some sort of mental health issue. Uh, is this person off his meds? Because there's very little reason to, you know, do that, to complete that type of attack without provocation. Um, you know, so it's completely inexcusable. And we've been seeing a lot of attacks on our law enforcement this week. And it's, you know, there's absolutely no justification from one person attacking a police officer to an army of domestic terrorists trying to take down a governor. This is not appropriate. This is not American values at play. And uh, this person in this case should be charged, tried, and most likely convicted based on the body cam video and the evidence that's going to be presented. Right. I think you're right. I mean, I think they have a lot of evidence right there to convict him on those charges that we saw. Joseph, there was a lot of blood from the police officer. I mean, I guess a gun can do that much damage. Could you get killed mm -hmm. by getting hit in the head repeatedly with the, you know, with a pistol like that? He could be charged with attempted murder as well, don't you think? Uh, yeah, pretend gun here. There's all kinds of, like, little interesting edges along the side here. Now, just imagine this thing actually being made out of metal or composite, very heavy. It's like getting hit in the head with a car bumper. And particularly if it's wielded in a very aggressive manner, you can split people's heads open. I've had cases where people have been bludgeoned to death. Uh, it's called pistol whipping. They've been bludgeoned to death with a firearm. It's a very, very dangerous situation. But if I could just add, this is part of the danger of being in law enforcement. I like to say that uh, us in investigations and law enforcement, you know, we're always having to uh, view the abnormal in the context of the normal. You just don't expect somebody to come in off of the street take your weapon from you and uh, just beat you down to the ground. And you never can tell what you're gonna wa be walking into or who's gonna approach you. This guy's a 30 year veteran. I can only imagine his horror. Uh, you know, he's thinking, you know, my God, you know, I've, I've gone all this time. I, can I just make it to retirement and get out of this crazy business? Um, and here he is and he's bleeding out on the floor. Very dangerous situation. You're absolutely right. You don't know who's going to walk in the door. And he had sunglasses and a hat on. He looked perfectly innocent, but we know now yeah. that is different. We have footage showing the suspect being arrested. Let's take a look at that now. Let me see your hands. Get hands. Down. Get down on the ground. Get down on the ground. Get I got one. I got one. I got Give me your Give me your Give me your Give us the hands, man. 
I got one. Oh, 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 get him for a gift. Oh, oh, there he is, buddy. You're going to get hurt. He just got his right arm. Okay, there, you go. The there you go. Go, 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 go. go. Right. We got the right arm now. Okay. I'm getting cuts. I'm getting cuts. I, I got cuts. I got cuts. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I got his right arm. All right. We got it. Yep. Be cool. Yep. All, right. Be cool. All right, we got him, we got him. Okay. Sing cuss. Oh, right. You good? You right? I think I brought it. Oh, 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 we know that Guzman has been charged with attempted murder of a peace officer, but there we saw the officers really holding him down, putting his hands behind his back. Do you think any of that was excessive, considering what occurred beforehand? I'm not sure it was excessive. I mean, here you have a defendant uh, who just stole a gun from a police officer, violently attacked that police officer, almost killed that police officer, and is, you know, according to that body cam video, potentially unloading rounds of that same gun at whoever, and then trying to flee. I think that the officers here subdued the subject uh, to the best of their abilities, and at least they didn't kill the guy. At least the defendant can uh, stand trial and is afforded due process here. I know that bar is very low, but, you know, when you see this type of outcome, it's, you know, more positive because the defendant didn't die here. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, I'm glad no one died here. And the police officer, Joseph, let me ask you this. You know, he said at one point he felt as though he was going to black out. So that does show us the, you know, severity of the pistol whipping, correct? Yeah, it's a concussive injury. There's no telling what kind of, you know, head trauma, brain trauma this guy might have subdued. I mean, sustained. I, I got to tell you, you know, back to my point earlier about uh, the weight of a weapon and being pistol whipped with it, it. It's it's the equivalent of being in a car accident and over and over again many times, particularly if the individual is striking you in the head repeatedly. So it's very dangerous. I also want to make a point here. I, you know, I think that this is another example of the failure of probably the mental health system in America. Uh, this guy is unbalanced. Uh, we have a number of folks that are walking the streets nowadays that get into angry uh, interactions with police officers, uh, and uh, they're completely non-compliant. And I don't understand what's so difficult about being compliant. Uh, so that that makes me think that there is a mental health issue here. Uh, you know, I was encountering them years and years ago when I was on the street, this has only escalated even further. Uh, I think Gigi had mentioned earlier, maybe it was you, Terry, that maybe the individual is off their meds. The problem is, is that once you put people on meds, if that is the case here, uh, they have to stay on meds. They have to be maintained in order for all of us to be safe. You know, if he had walked into the home of a single mom with a bunch of kids and he started acting out this way, we could have a house full of dead people. Exactly. Gigi was the one who mentioned the medication, and maybe he was off of his medication. Gigi, do you think that that would be a good defense to say that, you know, he has some mental illness and maybe he was off his medication? Well, it depends on what the circumstances of him not being on his medication is. Is this someone who relies on the government and for whatever reason uh, the mental health services being provided to him were revoked? Or is this someone who is totally capable of uh, getting his own medications? He has access to private care and just decided on a whim not to uh, take his medications. I think that him being off his meds, if he has a diagnosed uh, mental disorder or mental defect is mitigating mit as a mitigating factor, but it's not going to justify his actions here. Right, exactly. You know, I think we're going to have to see what happens for this trial because clearly there was something that was going wrong with this individual. I'd like to thank Gigi Gonzalez and Joseph Scott Morgan for their expert opinions. Stay tuned for more here on Law and Crime. Thank you.